This is a Glock, and at the risk of offending some of you, it is utterly soulless, accomplishing only two things. It is very cheap and very reliable. It unfortunately has trained some of you to leave the YouTube comment that no pistol should ever cost more than the price of a Glock. And this is a 1911, God's gift to the United States of America, the greatest handgun ever to be made, and this particular one is hand-built by a skilled American craftsman. As many of you go down your 1911 journey, this ultimately is what you're in pursuit of. Not only a gun that is mechanically superior to its production gun counterpart, but a gun that taps into what it means to be an American. And today, we're taking a look at what goes into making a hand-built 1911. Okay, here we are. We are at Alchemy Custom Weaponry, as we can see right, right there. That's right. Yeah, right there. Uh, Eli's been on the show before, but for people that don't know, why don't you introduce yourself? You got your pontoon boat, all <laughs> kinds of exciting stuff. Hey, y'all. So this is Eli with Alchemy Custom Weaponry. Uh, you know, I, I really feel that I'm kind of a prophet of John Moses Browning. Yeah. You know, I feel You've like You've been put on this earth to do one thing. That's still 1911s, you know? Yep. And it's one of those things that it's, it, you know, my job title is sales and marketing of uh, Alchemy Custom Weaponry, but really it's not even a job. It's a charge, if you will. Yes. It's something that I was, it's a God-given right. A mission. A mission, if yes. you will. You know, um, it, if I don't do this, I may not get to heaven, and that's what I'm doing here, selling 1911s, and in my opinion, some of the best on the planet. Yeah, and so um, today basically we're gonna look at, so, so you guys hear kind of the, you know, you watch our channel, but our channel, I'm not a gunsmith, right? Uh, I'm not a techie guy. So we'll review guns from a shooter's perspective, try to give a little bit of value within that, but you'll hear things like hand fit guns versus production guns, and they can become a little bit buzzy, but what we're trying to do today is really show you guys, hey, what goes into actually making a hand fit 1911 um, and why does it matter? Because that is the sad reality is a lot of people just don't think that any gun should ever be more than like $7.99 and you're just like, guys, you don't know what goes into this. And so, I mean, you're, you'll see now, I mean, there's human beings back there. They're working, they have files, they have sandpaper. American there's, human beings. Yeah, there's shit going on. So. Yeah. We're gonna really just kind of show you start to finish what goes into making these bad boys. So let's kick it off. So this is an Alchemy Prime Elite 45 ACP, God's caliber. And uh, I know what you're thinking. We're talking about building 1911s. Why are we starting at the finished product? Well, I think we have to start here so you can appreciate what you're about to see and the work that these talented craftsmen uh, put into getting to this point. And so as we hear beautifully uh, built gun, perfectly reliable, perfectly accurate, and honestly, something that's gonna raise your testosterone levels, but how do we get there? And that's what we're gonna talk about on today's episode of the 1911 Syndicate. Guys, uh, a quick mention here. So we're on the, on the balcony here at the facility. I'm gonna take off my belt just to show you. These things are rated for 6,000 pounds, which means I could take the belt, I could loop it around here, and I could pull a Tom Cruise Mission Impossible and swing off of this and repel. Am I gonna do it? I don't know. I might. But all you really need to know, this bad boy is from Seguera. I'm gonna leave it there just in case. Uh, it's from Seguera. There's code you guys can plug in. It's 1911 Syndicate. That saves you guys 10% off the store. This is my EDC belt. It's on me right now. It's a light inner Velcro belt. They've also got the the primary emissary belt, the battle wagon, bunch of cool stuff for your vehicles, uh, mag carriers, a lot of different stuff. You should check it out. They've been a sponsor of the channel for a long time now. Um, great company, great products. Uh, like I said, plug in that code, that'll save you guys a few bucks. Let's start talking about 1911s. All right, y'all. So we're gonna start where the gun begins and that's back here with Zach. So we get all the parts kind of ordered up and uh, you know kitted up together and Zach goes through and makes sure that all of the guns, parts are correct for that order. So he has the, what we call the traveler over there and he's gonna make sure all the parts for whatever people order, because we do have several options. So he's gonna make sure all of those are correct for that gun, for that serial number. And he's gonna kit it all together so our gunsmiths really don't have to do any thinking when they get to the gun. Uh, the other thing is he also, if you notice, is using a by God file in his hands and his eyes and those no robots, no machines. I think his, I think his ear, ear pro over there are the only, only uh, real electronic things back here. He's going through and deburring the whole gun, getting it prepped up. 
you know, this is something that we found adds a, a you know, cuts down a little bit of time. And uh, he just goes in there, cleans up all those surfaces, make them good for the gunsmiths to have a good base to build the gun on. All right, now, as you probably know, being a 1911 connoisseur yourself, when you go to pick up a new 1911, a uh, custom 1911 specifically, what are, what are the two things you're immediately drawn to? Uh, I'm checking slide to frame and I'm probably checking barrel. That's right. Slide to frame and barrel fit, I think people even check those over the trigger. Uh, on a lot of guns, you know, because that that's where a lot of your tangible notice in a custom 1911 is, right? Yep, yep. So as soon as you pick up that gun, racking it, feeling the, the fit, you, you kind of want that gun to feel all like it's one piece. Mark here is uh, one of our guys who do barrel fits and slide to frame fits. And again, you'll notice a lack of uh, electronic things here. Um, that's because Mark painfully <laughs> fits these frames and slides by hand so Mark, if you want to quickly walk us through kind of what you're doing here um, with fitting the frames and slides, fitting the barrels, just give us a quick rundown on that. Uh, well, typically where I start is, um, you know, the frames usually deburr by the time it gets to me. I'll um, do a few prep things, get rid of some of the hard edges. Uh, I'll be taking measurements off of the frame rails as well as the slide. Um, first off, make sure that the slide and the frame will fit together. You know, if I have a slide that's a little too wide, I might not use it, I might go grab a different slide. Um, the main components that we're gonna be looking for is gonna be the width, and then the depth of the slide fitting into this groove right there. Um, so I'll end up sitting there with this right here, grab this file, and I'm gonna be working my way down and just keep going until that starts to creep its way onto the frame. And then uh, I'll eventually get to the point where I can get it all the way back and forth. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm going to just slather it with oil, lap it with oil, and then we have uh, a bore paste essentially that we use and lap that up, get that nice and finished, um, nice and smooth. And hopefully the result is something like this where nice and smooth goes back and forth. But when it's in battery, it's not moving up and down. It's not moving side to side. So you don't really want any play in that. Correct. Yeah. And you know, it's it's interesting here. You got this one all nice and buttery smooth, but when it gets to you, that slide ain't going on that frame, is it? No, it uh, <laughs> it usually barely starts. It barely starts, that's um, right. So yeah, it'll end up right there <laughs> when I first get it. And keep in mind too, you know, when, when we start with these components, and have to get them down to that buttery smooth. It is a hand that is doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From yeah. the minute that it barely goes on to that point where you just saw it buttery smooth. And that is, <laughs> Mark, would you say it's an easy process? Uh, it's <laughs> tedious, for sure. It's a tedious process, for And sure. so in essence, I mean, it's like stock removal. I mean, you're removing material bit by bit by bit until we find that sweet spot. Correct. Is yeah. that like the bro science version? Yeah, kind of? okay. yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, you could just hog it off and like hope that it fits, but you're probably gonna end up with something yeah. a little looser than you'd like. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Just walking that frame to slide fit together and, and making what we would think is a, like I said, there's a lot of philosophies on fitting the guns, but we want them tight, but still smooth. Yeah. And I mean, it's not to say that a gun that has a little bit of rattle in it is a bad gun. Like, that's not the point. It's just to say, what one, this is an alchemy philosophy, yeah. not like, uh, but also a tight fit gun would be a point of pride if you're spending a lot of money on a gun. Like, if you dropped a lot of money on a gun and it's a rattle bucket, you're like, all right, yeah, that's a little odd. Well, in conjunction too, yeah, I feel that. Give you give you a little feel of that. Right. I, I mean, and that's just, hand done. Yeah, very glassy, very glassy. And there's just nothing in you know. There's there's no play in that bad boy. And that thing's not even barreled up or got springs. Right. I mean, that's just the yeah. frame and slide fit there. And then going from there, we've got the barrel fit. Now, in my opinion, that's the hallmark of a custom 1911. Going back to the original guns, you know? You, it's like that, uh, you know, when we did the hunt for Gucci guns, I don't know if it's come out before or after this, but when I showed you that hardball Remington Rand, mm -hmm. the rest of the gun really wasn't great, yeah. but that barrel sure was fit pretty good. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. in my opinion, that's where that's where your accuracy is. Um, you know, there's a lot of contact points on the barrel, you, from the bushing to the, to the upper lugs, the lower lugs, and you know, how it fits into the frame. 
a lot of that stuff is really important. And uh, Mark, why don't you uh, give us a give us a little talk about fitting the barrels because that's that's a key hallmark of the custom 1911, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, as Eli was saying, there are several points to kind of work at and to, to look at, and I kind of work at them one at a time. Uh, first thing I'll go for is the hood fit. Um, so generally the way the 45s are fit, the width isn't too bad, uh, but we will have to adjust the length. And uh, what I'm going for is I want contact all the way across so it's nice and square, even, um, but it's not hanging up at all. Okay. Um, so if it's touching, I have no problem with that as long as it's moving freely. Okay. Um, if it's just barely a little bit, I'd, I'd be happy with that, um, but ideally we want to touch a little bit. But once I have the hood fit, um, then I'm going to work on the upper lugs. That's going to be this guy right here. And the main reason for that is we want to make sure that the barrel sits up far enough so that the firing pin actually hits the primer. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a bit tight, but it doesn't go off at this point. Yeah, right. yeah. Right, 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 right. Um, and at that point, if once those are fit, then I'm going to start looking at the lower lugs. Okay. I want to make sure that there is... Uh, nice contact, once again, even and square all the way across. But I also want to make sure there's nothing up front. Uh, so barrel bump is something where um, I'm sure you may have seen it on something a little bit less expensive. Or define, define barrel bump. I'm not sure I know what, what, what you mean on that. So when the slide stop goes in, barrel bump is where the slide stop is going to hit first before going up on the lugs. Okay. And that's eventually just going to deform the lugs going to bend the slide stop you're going to have a lot of issues with that and you're eventually just going to have a gun that doesn't work okay. and uh, you know that is actually an interesting point you bring up mark with uh, with uh, barrel bumps so there will be a lot of guns that you feel that barrel lock up you feel the, the barrel squat and you won't feel anything and you and you'll unlock and it'll have that nice old school pop and a lot of times it's not necessarily that the gun is hard fit or nicely fit and it's the fact that that barrel bump is is kind of giving you this quasi feeling hmm. and so that's something you can check pretty easily with your with your barrel link and you just basically put your slide stop into the barrel link and move it across the lower lugs and it, you'll see if it you know makes contact or not i'll be honest with you i've a lot of uh a lot of production guns will have that um you know and like, like Mark said, that isn't really a problem when you first start shooting the gun, but at some point it can become a problem because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. going to deform your, it's your like lower a, It's lugs. like a repetitive stress. Yes, yeah. yep, yep, yep. So, um, absolutely. So now we're going to get into the bushing, which is an important thing too. Um, so while I'm fitting the barrel, I just have a super loose bushing. Yeah. Uh, just kind of get everything fit. I'm going to use that guy. Um, but then uh, we're going to put this on there. So this one, I can feel it is rubbing a little bit on the end of the barrel, which is what we want. We do want contact there. That's going to help keep things nice and tight. Um, we also want to fit it to the slide. So this lug right here, we want to make sure it fits in there, but we don't want it just spinning around loose in there. We want it to hold the barrel in, yeah, in place. Play. Yeah. Well, and that's something I've noticed uh, a very wide variety on, on, on bushing guns is you know, there's guns I get in where I'll depress a little plunger. I can just spin the bushing, no problem. I mean, that thing's just floating around. And honestly, when I got my Quantico, so I've got a single stack Quantico. When I got that in, that's a tight ass gun. Um, you know, it's like, you're using a tool. Like you are using a tool to get that bushing off. Now, now I do want to make a, a, a kind of note on the bushing uh, because this is another thing in the 1911 world that has a, a variable, we'll say. Uh, you know, super loose to super tight. Yeah. We at Alchemy actually do try to find a happy medium because I'm going to be honest with you, as beautiful as our guns are, yeah. they're fighting guns. And yeah. in my opinion, a fighting gun needs to be taken apart with no tools. Uh, and so we really do want to find a good medium of a, a tight bushing, but we don't want it to be so tight that every single time you use the gun, you yeah. have to use a bushing wrench. Yeah. Uh, we want fighting guns you know, essentially what we would call a combat automatic. So we do want to find that happy medium, which uh, Mark, you know, barreling these guns, you've been barreling these guns for years now. So, you know, he's got a good, good sense of that. Yeah. Hell yeah. Very cool. Very awesome. cool. And so, you know, that's, that covers your, your two big things. I think a lot of 1911 guys look at immediately with the gun. And as you kind of have seen, it's all done by hand. 
you know, and it's one of those things where you have to ask yourself, you know, why? Why is it done by hand? Well, I think it preserves that American art form there. And uh, you know something else, too, that you don't realize in, in a kind of a, um, a marketing point, if you will, is that tighter frame to slide, that tight barrel that, you know, relatively, if you have a 45 hard, we'll, we'll use that in quote, hard lockup barrel, that actually not only does it help with your accuracy, but if you shoot a regular production 45 versus a custom 45, tell me that you don't notice a recoil impulse difference. There is absolutely a recoil, recoil impulse difference as those tighter uh, components actually delay or, and, and I'm not even trying to be ugly, retard the slide a little bit as it goes rearward, softens the recoil up a little bit. Uh, there is absolutely not only an accuracy, but in actual performance of the gun, a difference in a tight fit, custom gun, and a production gun. Oh yeah, awesome. Awesome, well, with from there, we're actually gonna go over to Brant because we actually have initiated a new system where we QC between every part of the gun. Now, there are, again, tons of philosophies for building 1911s, and I'm not here to tell you those are wrong. I'm just telling you how we do it. Yeah, yeah. So we have really talented people doing the things they're very talented at. Now, I will say we've cross-trained everybody, so they're pretty damn good at building a 1911 from scratch if they've got to. But where those people excel, we kind of stick them where they're going to make the bet, you know, the most uh, bang for the buck, you know, for the company as far as production goes. But what we've instituted is rather than these parts go to the next stage of, of manufacturing, we're actually including QC at every level so we can catch things if something happens earlier rather than later. Okay. So we're gonna go over here to Brant. All right, Jake, now you've seen, you know, kind of how the genesis of America's pistol uh, kind of gets started over there with barrel and a slide to frame fit. And as I mentioned over there, we do check QC at every stage of the pistol's, uh, you know, conception, if you will. Yep. Uh, you know, and now we're with Brant here who has a beautiful Quantico high cap. Uh, and he's gonna walk us through kind of the, what he's looking for on this QC process, you know, Again, everything's done by hand. Now, I do want to mention, uh, we do have QC components that are both vintage to kind of go in with our brand, as well as uh, brand new. We have some new uh, QC stuff, more QC in the parts coming in. Uh, but this, of course, this takes, you know, feel that's, you can't just come off the street and QC these guns. You gotta have some know-how, you gotta have some feel. Um, there's a lot of, you know, working with your hands that just somebody who's not used to that can't mm -hmm. do it. Sure. So, okay. Brant, let's talk about QC. All right, so in between any process that we do here, um, whether it be fitting the station one components, fitting the whole top end of the gun together, doing the lower half of the gun, blending, beveling, whatever, uh, before the finished product goes out to a finished vendor, before any of those things happen, it comes over here to my desk and I get to tear it apart and nitpick stuff and annoy everyone else with little detail stuff that can be tweaked here or there. Um, most of this is based off of function. Um, there are, is certainly a portion of this that deals with aesthetics. We base a lot of our QC processes off of the American Pistol Smith Guild. Um, so it is a pretty rigorous set of standards that we hold um, to make sure that every gun that we send out is a pretty consistent product that's gonna give you kind of what you're looking for as a, as a consumer. Um, so there's a lot of little stuff, um, nice little details. We put a small bevel on the front of the slide nose here. So if you do have a particularly tight bushing that you have to use your barrel as a bit of a slide hammer, right? You're not gonna booger up the front of your lower lugs in doing that action, which is a nice little thing. Um, but we'll check stuff like headspace, Make sure we have a good headspace on the gun. Do a little plunk test with a dummy bullet as well. That's below the barrel hood. We're looking for about eight thousandths between the back of the gauge and the hood of the barrel, which we've got. So we're good on that regard. And each station varies a little bit in what we're actually looking for here. Um, I'm just gonna check lower lug and upper lug contact real fast, like. And 
you can see where the marker got removed on this gun. You got pretty good contact. There's a little hint of barrel bump on this side. We'll probably hit that, get rid of that there. Dang. Yeah, because this is way more than, uh, you know, it's like I intellectually know things like this probably happen, but you know. Oh, when you see it, it, cha it changes everything. You know, when you yeah. see this happen, you see the amount of work, you see the amount of know-how, the amount of feel. I yeah. mean, this is stuff that you just have to feel to know what, what you're looking for. Right. Uh, you can't just, I'll be honest, you can't even take a lot of gunsmiths straight out of gunsmithing school. And this is stuff you this, have to teach them still. Specialty. This is pretty specialty stuff. And, and keep in mind that this is an art form that's been perfected for over 100 years. Right. The gun has been made for over 100 years and we're still producing that product today. Man, it's just wild. getting better and better. Eh, I don't know if you can name another gun that has that history. No. I mean, is there another gun from that era that's, Not that's in current production, still used in a duty capacity? I mean... The, the Browning M2. Okay. <laughs> also John Browning, uh, John Browning design. Yeah. <laughs> but certainly not a gun that's hand fit. Uh, so, you know, this makes all the difference, I think. And when you see what goes into it, you start to think, yeah, yeah, this makes sense on why that there's this price associated with this. I mean, there is a lot of skilled time and labor into this. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, so after this, then where do we go? Guys, you know what I hate? When I order something on the internet and they're like, thank you for your order. And then like three minutes later, you get another email. They're like, oh, sorry, that's not in stock, bro. We'll get you a refund. I hate it, I won't stand for it, not on my watch, not in America. Um, at Big Tech's ordinance, that doesn't happen, okay? If they say that it's in stock, it is. If the order is placed by two o'clock Central Standard, aka Texas time, uh, it's gonna ship out the same day. There is a, and they carry all kinds of gear, by, by the way. I mean, from accessories, you know, lights, optics, all kinds of things uh, you guys could go and check out there. I would recommend it. I did it for years prior to about a month ago when they started sponsoring the channel. So uh, the code you guys can plug in is 1911 SYN, like S-Y-N. Um, that'll save you guys 10% off the store, which is great. Cause like I said, a lot of great stuff. And hey, depending on what the thing is, 10% adds up to be pretty significant. So um, scope that out. You get a copy of the constitution. You get a pack of candy in your order. Who doesn't like sugar for God's sakes. Um, and the last thing, if you guys need real estate help, let us know behind the scenes. The 1911 syndicate is a real estate company servicing a handful of different cities from uh, Utah and Texas, Nevada and Colorado and so on <clears throat> and so forth. Patreon also linked below. If you guys want behind the scenes content, special merch, we do some private classes, uh, Q and A's, all kinds of fun shit. So anyway, check that out. Let's get back to talking about the old 1911. All right, so we're about, you know, halfway-ish through. And I do want to quickly say, by this point, I probably said a, said a lot of things in a video with you that are fairly offensive. I feel like I'm on my best behavior today. Very calm. You know? Very calm. I feel calm. like I'm I'm pretty chill. I, I feel like there could be a bomb coming, but well, it hadn't you know, gone Yeah, yet. no, yeah. I, I, I'm pretty good, you know, in work mode, as they say. Yeah. But anyways, we're back with Brant. We're going to talk about kind of fitting all the uh, other things of a 1911. So that includes... You know, the grip safety, the main spring housing, the trigger, of course, that being, I think, the third hallmark of a, of a custom 1911, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. trigger. You always want to have a good trigger. And I think people mistake a lot of things with triggers. I think people want the lightest trigger always. Yeah. It's, it's like not lightest isn't best. best. That's yeah. right. So what we try to do is, and just touching on that really quickly, we try to get everything between a three and a half pound and a four pound trigger pull. Yeah. And again, to reiterate, that's because while these are beautiful guns, they are fighting pistols. Yeah. We want to give you a, that good trigger, but something that's still safe for defensive care. Right, right. Of course, so uh, let's get in here with Brant. Let's talk a little bit, Brant, about uh, you know the grip safety fit, the trigger fit, all the little things that you're going to have to fit by hand. That This becomes really tedious, you know, Yeah. Uh, as far as custom 1911s go. Um, so right now on my bench, I have a frame. Pretty much most of the small components of a frame torn apart here. Um, there is not a single part amongst this stack that we don't do something with. Um, our triggers come in pretty significantly oversized. So they have to be fit to the frame. Um, we want this to be able to gravity move, but not have any up and down play or side to side play at all. We really like that to be absolutely solid. Um, that takes quite a bit of measurement and filing and polishing of things. Um, we add a very small bevel to the corners of the trigger. That way it does not pinch in the frame. 
Um, that's all done by hand. That's not something that comes on the product when we get it as a part. Um, thumb safeties we modify pretty extensively as well. Um, all of this edge is gonna get pushed back significantly more, quite a second flat spot on that. Um, grip safeties will not drop in the frame. I've been working on this one a little bit. Um, so this will drop in the frame at this point um, and be able to move freely. But when these come out of the bin, they absolutely will not go in the frame at all. Okay. Um, so we have to remove material, remove and, material and mostly and play that frame. game in order to be able to get that going. Um, we'll make some modifications to the magazine catch to make it easier to insert a magazine into the gun um, and also prevent this extended mag catch from binding against the body of the magazine, not letting the magazine drop free. All the springs get flat ground and polished. They don't come out of the pack like that. We do that by hand. Um, your mainspring cap and cup, um, these will all get hand polished as well. That's something we do uh, in-house. Disconnector and sear will get polished up. The mainspring housing itself, sometimes these will go into the frame, sometimes they won't. Um, this particular one will but we add the large bevel across the lower portion of the frame by hand. That is not done um, out of the Just box. Just so you're not, you don't have like a little hot spot down there? Yeah, absolutely. Or if you are using this as a carry gun, you don't want a super harsh angle that's gonna put holes in yeah, the Yeah, 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 totally. Grab clothing and whatnot. Um, so there is a lot of work that goes into all of this. Um, sear springs are adjusted and polished by hand. Um, they don't come out of the packaging ready to go either. So there's not a single part that goes in the bottom half of this gun that doesn't get messed with a little bit. And then like, so so on trigger, you know, man, it, you have to kind of be in the shooting 1911s to know, but there, there are 19, some of the comes from like striker fire world, almost any 1911 trigger is gonna feel like insane to them, right? But it's like, there are bad 1911 triggers. Like, oh, yeah. um, yep. it, it, I, I mean, I reviewed a gun recently, went on a, on a series 80 build where you're like, this is just, there's so much mush and everything in this. Sure, maybe not if you're coming from Glock world, but it's like, man, if you know a decent 1911 trigger, there are big levels to that game. So like, are you, are you, you know, inevitably there's gonna be that little bit of take up that's yep. almost in every 1911. Um, but then, you know, once you hit that wall, you're just looking for that clean break. No, no, we're going, we're going, then it breaks. No yeah. rolling, no sponginess. We run a fixed over travel stop in all of our triggers, except the Videcki three hole style trigger that is adjustable. Um, so these are actually hand filed by hand to set over travel as well. Okay. Um, so there is nothing um, with that entire trigger set up that isn't done by one of us individually, gun by gun. Um, and that gets checked actually several times. Yeah. So it gets checked before it comes to in, in process inspection. It gets checked at in process inspection. Um, prior to test fire, once it's out of test fire and gets assembled uh, as a finished product, it gets checked again. Okay. Um, and then I'm fairly certain that Dan in the shipping room will check it a third time. And then once it gets to our distribution uh, location, it gets checked again. Nice. Um, so the trigger is something that is checked probably more than any other single function. Yeah, because if you get a tight fit gun and you're like, but the trigger shit, <laughs> like what the hell, you know, like what happened? Um, that's just not a thing. Yeah, you got a you got a thousand horsepower car and you're running regular street tires. You can't get all right. that horsepower to the road. You no. know, it doesn't do you any no, good no, to have no. all that good, yeah. you know, frame and slide fit. And so, uh, you know, and it's one of those things too. I want to quickly mention. Um, we do at Alchemy run a Series 70. I don't even like the term Series 70 because. We just run the original print it's for It's like the what it should be. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we don't use a collet bushing, which is another thing Colt kind of introduced with the Series 70, so we have a standard bushing. But um, we, we just have a standard 1911. is not a Series 80 gun. Uh, for those of you that don't know, a Series 80 gun, of course, has the uh, fire and pin disconnect that was introduced by, uh, by Colt in, the, in, I think, in 1983 via some lawsuits and, you know, just the the 80s, which were super cool, but like we're making V8s with 190 horsepower kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not a great, you know, time for guns and cars in the no. 80s. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, we run, we run the original print for the 1911 and that also aids in getting a really good uh, trigger out of the gun. Yeah, awesome. 
All right, Jake. So now we're at the beveling, blending portion of uh, the Alchemy 1911 experience. And you know, it's one of those things where I remember it's an old Jeff Cooper trope where you gotta have a trigger you can pull, sights you can see, and a gun that doesn't tear your clothes and hands up uh, when it comes to a custom 1911. And this is certainly one of the things we like to take a lot of pride in. Mm -hmm. And not only that, we want a gun that looks good because honestly, making a gun that's soft up and it's not gonna tear you up, it's not super hard. Take it over to a buffing wheel, start playing around with it, but it's gonna look like hell. Yeah. And so I've got Tori here and Tori, I, and she's you know gonna blush a little bit. I promise you, she's one of the best working a file on a gun that I've ever seen. She is just absolutely phenomenal. So now she's starting master out. Master Beveler. Yeah, Master <laughs> master Beveler. That's the word. You know, that is a... Uh, we asked don't around say, town last night. They were like, oh, Tori. <laughs> Tori oh, Tori's shit, the Jesus. Master Beveler. Uh, don't say that three times fast. But no. so Tori, so Tori's got a, uh, you know, we've already worked through all the processes we've covered so far. And now Tori's going to begin to melt these parts together. Mm. And this is where some real American artistry, uh, as you can tell, Tori's a pretty artistic person in general. <laughs> but this is where the artistry kind of comes into the performance of the gun. So I'm going to let Tori take it away and talk about that from here. Okay. So, I mean, primarily what I do is I'm going to cut down all of these sharp angles all around the front of the dust cover here. Um, I try to do a 45 degree angle, um, but I do it by hand. So, I don't know that it's 45, but it's close. I just kind of... And it's, and it's one of these things too where like, again, we're, we're, we're a continuing trope with this is it's hand done. Yeah. Like there is there is artistry in this in the fact that yes, it's a performance pistol. We want you to use them. We want you to shoot them. But like this is a piece of art. I yeah, mean, it's it a is, human with a file. It's a human I mean, with a file. Yeah. This is like been around for I'm going to assume hundreds of years. Hundreds of uh, years. Not yep. the 1911, but it's like I making mean, tools yep. and weapons with hand tools is. I mean, that's primitive. That you know, and it's something that I think. It, it, you know, and I'm biased, I work for a 1911 company, but I truly believe every American at some point, I don't care if it's the, you're the last day you're alive, some point should have the opportunity to at least shoot at, or, you know, hopefully own uh, one of these just absolutely American classics here. So Yeah, well, I'm, I'm on the team. So, of course, uh, Tori, I do want you to show, like, something with the magwell. So magwells, oh, yeah. of course, uh, are imperative, I think, with... Uh, fighting 1911s. Can you go without them? Absolutely, but yeah. let's on be honest. On a single stack, it's, on, it's yeah. rough. On a single stack, you really do want to have a, a, a magwell on that gun. So we actually start with our a Stan Chin magwell. A lot of people appreciate Stan's part. The Chin kids are fantastic. Just that whole family is wonderful. But we have a, our own Stan Chin magwell. It's made to our spec, okay? If you okay. pop the, that has the Alchemy logo on it and everything. Yeah. So, you know, if we pop that out, which you don't have to, but it, it has the Alchemy logo on the back. It's awesome. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, nice. So, of course, it says ACW there with the Stan Chin. And uh, so he makes those for us. And from there, Tori's going to have to work those bevels together to make a seamless magazine, uh, you know, transition, okay? So it's one of those things where we want we don't want the magazine to hang up on anything and, and obstruct, because let's say you don't want to put a magwell on the gun and the magwell be the reason you can't get a good right. reload. Well, and I also see magwells with, uh, uh, again, on some things that I've gotten in not that long ago, like I can see light between the frame and the magwell. Yep. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that's probably not what I would like to have happen. Like that's pretty obvious. Yeah, and so I've got a gun here that, that uh, Tori's actually already beveled. And you can see here where she's come in and softened a lot of these lines up on the uh, thumb safety. Of course, that's a key component to comfort with the gun. Right. Uh, you know, so this is a key area we want to make sure is softened up. You know, the grip safety she's she's blended in. You'll actually notice we recontour by hand, by the way. We recontour the grip safety, if you will. Thank you, Tori. You can actually see the difference there where oh, we yeah. completely recontour Oh, it's a totally that. different oh, shape. And, and again, that's a lot of material to go that off is. by hand. That's actually pretty yeah. significant. Yeah, so that that's, you know, that adds to the time and stuff. And then, of course, the magwell. Um, you know, you can see here where those magwells are completely oh, blended yeah. together for a seamless magazine uh, change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's one of those things, like, as shooters, we take all that for granted. Yes. When you change a magwell on a gun, you know, you're doing a speed reload, and it got good, you know, 
good in magazine insert. You're back in the you're back in the fight. It's something we we take for granted. Yeah, yeah. But like when you sit here and you see all the time she spends making this a possibility, mm -hmm. it kind of makes you step back and say, yeah, thank you for yeah, clean making magazine. my reload. Yeah, yeah making my reload faster. Not getting killed in the streets. Yeah, exactly. You know? Well, I got a Tech Nine. I know about, about <laughs> you that. You know about yeah. the streets. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and so this is just something that I think is imperative with a custom 1911. And again, uh, not only does it help with, uh, you know, not tearing up your holsters, not tearing up your clothes, but it also just adds to the whole experience of the gun. Yeah, like I said, you know, it, it all melts together where, let's get rid of all these hot spots. Let's have all this thing just sort of seamlessly blend together and just feel like it's made to be at home with each other, yeah. which is what it is. Absolutely. It just, I'm going to be honest with you, man. This is, I, you know, I've been here so many times. I've done so much stuff with these guys, and every single time it makes me so damn proud to be an American. American manufacturing right here in the heartland, you know, it's just with American steel, you know, it just is, is one of those things. Like, we're making guns for Americans. Yeah. Love it's, it. it, it's a proud moment for us. Kick ass. Yeah. And so now we're, we're starting, we're at turn four, baby. Okay. You know what I mean? Like the checkered flag's waving. We're coming around turn four. We're getting close to the Home end. Home stretch. Uh, and this has been definitely a journey uh, that, you know, goes through so many different facets, but the main thing, hand build. Yep. And that continues to the finishing portion of the gun. So of course, Alchemy Custom Weaponry, we focus a lot on the classical nature. You know, that's why we still hot salt blue guns in house. I mean, we, uh, hard chrome guns. We, de you know, we DLC them. That's kind of our newest finish. Yeah. Really. I and like that hard chrome though. Hard chrome is the sauce. Yeah. yeah. Hard chrome is gangster. Yeah. And so, uh, of course, we then also hand prep these guns. So here I got Chris, who is going to kind of walk us through briefly. Briefly, there's a couple things I really want to talk about, but briefly we're going to talk about you know the final finish when you're getting it ready to go out to bluing or chrome or whatever, what have you. Okay. So for final prep. I'm basically getting all the tool marks out of the, the slide and frame. Uh, so I'll clean it up with the air file uh, and uh, then work the, the flat parts of the slide and frame. Um, and that's basically the big part of it is just getting all the tool marks out and getting it ready to go out to the vendors. Do you have a before? Do you have something with tool marks to show me and something with them removed? Um, so here's the frame. You see the heavy tool marks right there? Yeah. The yeah. So you're... Your job is basically go in, make it look like a machine never really touched this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so, of course, you know, we do have the, every, all the single stack frames have that high undercut. Um, and that's done the, from the very beginning. You see some of the tool marks on there mm -hmm. and then where the ball cut is. Yeah, yeah, just gotta yeah. get all that out. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's one of those things. And I, one of the things I think the coolest that we do is we actually have, you know, we hand polish. Uh, the flats of our gun. So we'll come over here and he'll show you a couple of strokes on the hand polishing. Okay. All right, and so we're over here at, this is a granite, right? This is a granite top here that's perfectly level. Yep. So we're gonna get in here and get some polishing done. And so this is how we get the tool marks out? Yes, and polish the flats uh, for that finish when it calls for it. And that's like you saw in the beginning that really nicely flat uh, polished hard chrome gun i mean again not done with a machine done by hand he's sitting here he's having to you know eyeball things he's sitting there you know on, this is like a perfectly level top here so the point of the granite is that you're not using the granite to take out the marks the granite is no. just your smooth flat yeah. base it, to work it's on. helping keeping it uh, smooth and flat and also keeping this from sliding around okay um and then just make sure you keep your stroke straight. So if you see when it's uh, polished, they're all straight. Yeah, show, it to, show it to that. All straight, straight lines. That's what you're going for. Right, we don't want any wiggly lines. And so here's the blasted side and here's the, the polished side. And so here's the thing too, like our finishes being a lot of old school stuff, you know, with the exception of, get, again, the DLC, they will absolutely show defects in, in the in the finish process. Mm -hmm. You know, bluing shows everything. Charcoal blue shows everything. Hard chrome will certainly show everything. Right, right. So it's imperative that we take to our time on this process to make sure that we have a clean, good look. Because at the end of the day, right, these guns are functional. They're performance pistols. You know, they're they're combat pistols, but. You still want to have something that's just beautiful when also you get it. Also a piece of art, though. Yeah, you know, and it's like, hey, if you drop 
you know, whatever, call it four, four to five grand on a functional thing that kind of looks like shit or to the discerning eye, like lack detail, it lessens it, you know, it's, it's just not as, it's not as cool. Well, and you talk a lot about like supercars and stuff. And I think like, it's one of those things like, you know, even if a supercar's performance is extremely high, yeah. if it, if it's an ugly damn car, who gives a who shit? Gives a shit? Yeah. Right. So you gotta, you gotta have all those factors together. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. a key component because keep in mind, this is kind of that first impression too. That's the first thing you'll see when you see an Alchemy Custom Web 3 pistol is that finish. So it's imperative that this is done perfectly. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, all right, race fans. So we're down here at the finish line, the Pizza de Resistance. Yep. Um, yep, yep. You know, we're going to put this gun together. So, you know, of course, when the guns come back from finishing, whether that be hot salt blue, charcoal blue, uh, color case hard, DLC hard chrome if you're a gangster. Yeah. Um, when they come back in, obviously they're in a bunch of parts. We've kind of prepped this up for you a little bit, but. Uh, Nate here is going to put together probably our most gorgeous mm. top of the line, the the you know the pinnacle of Alchemy Custom Weaponry, and that is a charcoal blue gun for you. So, uh, uh, Nate, one question. Oh, I'm sorry. How excited are you to oh, be doing this right now? So excited. Yeah, yeah. I am ecstatic. Okay. Well, just know the fate of the United, of States, the United of States of America is on your shoulders putting this gun together. All right. And, and uh, one more word of advice: if you fuck this up, so help me God. Eli will fire you so fast. Actually, you know what? The firing is the least That's, of your worries. It's more of a Jeff thing anyway. Yeah, well, let's put this gun together. So when Nate, when Nate, when Nate's throwing this gun together, obviously it just came back from, uh, from you know, final prep. Nate, you can start putting it together. Do you, you need me to, you know, hold your hand while you do that? I think I got it. <laughs> so when Nate is putting this gun together, he's um, he's he's checking the gun, you know, making sure there's no impurities with the finish. Um, like hard chrome guns, there's always stuff you have to look out for because hard chrome is such an old school finish. I, I have a, a, a super dumb question. Oh yeah. So I always do the bushing last. You guys don't. No, no, no. We go, no. So the way we put together together a gun and uh, you know take it apart is use the reverse high powered method because when you use that bushing when you're cranking the bushing while uh, you know while the gun's in battery yeah. you're actually slowly degrading that bushing barrel fit. Well, that's um, awesome. If you'd like uh, on the Alchemy Custom Weaponry channel maybe you should take a look at this. I thought you I thought you were a fan. I thought you liked us. I didn't know um, you guys had a channel. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Sorry. Well, let me start doing ad reads, and maybe you'll maybe you'll notice me. Please. Uh, please. So, anyways, we, we have a good video about that. Um, taking your gun apart, putting it back together the way we do it. But yeah. So Nate has has com successfully completed. Successfully, you know yeah. your your life. You live to fight another day. Yeah. Now tomorrow is a whole nother whole nother deal. Whole nother battle. But this is a, a complete gun here. Complete charcoal blued gun, and you know it's one of those things that really is special. Uh, you know, of course charcoal bluing being probably the best finish ever on a 1911 so it's we started so with a complete gun now we've got a complete gun here it's something that makes you think you know god loves americans more than any other country because that's the handgun we have yeah. you know he and, you guys know the, and the time uh, grip screws oh yeah the time grip screws so these are in line with our uh, cock insurations you know everything there this is actually uh <laughs> this is actually center cut mammoth ivory Oh, okay. You know, so real gangster shit. Well, I mean, who, no one liked mammoths anyway. Yeah, if, if you know what? If people like mammoths, they'd still be around. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's how I feel about it. So, you know, this is one of those things that immediately raises your testosterone when you get it in your hand. Yeah. Uh, and it just, you know, it makes you feel like a better person. Yeah. You know, you are better having owned a 1911. Excellent. So that is, we've, we've kind of went full circle. We started with a gun. We finished with a gun. And you saw the extensive process in between of that and while it's not a very quick you know point a to point b getting this gun manufactured okay so a couple things so that's really cool first of all awesome see how yeah. the sausage is made kind of deal yeah. so a couple things perhaps a question or uh you know maybe pointers for people that do wind up getting into hand fit 1911s tighter guns like this i think is overall like kind of the notion of is there a break-in period and are they like maintenance nightmares? You know, what's it take to keep these things going? Yeah, so that is like a real old school misconception that the 1911 is a, a you know, crazy high maintenance gun. Uh, it's, it, it is and it isn't at the same time. It's one of those things where I've had guns, this carry gun actually, where, you know, I just kind of hock toe and spit on that thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just keep it running. 
Yep. Uh, very, very rarely do I actually clean that gun down to the down to the small parts. Um, but just give it, it that hock Just hock to spin on that thing, you know. And uh, it, but but it's one of these things where it's been you know blown out of proportion that these guns need an insane amount of maintenance. Now, do they need maintenance? Yes. Yeah. If you carry a gun, which again these are fighting pistols. It should be clean. I, there's no reason it shouldn't be clean. But no. uh, I've gone seven, eight, nine thousand, fifteen hundred 1,500 rounds without actually cleaning the gun. I just kind of like, just kind of spit on it, you know? Put some yeah. all on it, run, run it, and just keep it running. Get her back it, on the track. It's actually pretty interesting how long one of these bastards will, will run just by putting all in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So do these sons bitches uh, have a break-in period. Break-in period, yeah. So that's another old school 1911 misconception. And I, well, you know what? I don't even call it a misconception. It's one of those things that is very company specific. Some guns will have a large break-in period. Some won't. Um, you know, early less bears. You, you know, you're gonna need to. You're absolutely gonna need to shoot that gun. When I first got into the custom 1911 world, my first gun was a Springfield Professional. Yeah. Uh, it absolutely needed a break-in period yep, yep. Um, the way we build our guns and as you felt like the frame to slide fit the way we're barrel fitting we've got it figured out on what is a good way to build a gun that's got all the features you want but doesn't require you to you know have to put a thousand rounds through it for it to work properly now with any high-end 1911 I always uh, you know kind of coach our customers that you pretty much want to Put about uh, three to four hundred rounds is what I typically say through the gun. Sometimes things do need to work together, but for the most part, it's actually not uh, as strenuous as a lot of people think. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, I, I mean, hey, if you're still having stove pipes mouth, whatever the thing is, and it's been a couple thousand rounds, it's like, I, yeah, you probably got a gun problem now. On uh, our guns, I actually say after five hundred rounds, if you experience anything, you need to talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it I, after that the gun should be absolutely perfect and ready to go so yeah excellent so I I, I mean I, I guess sort of a final thought that you know we might leave people with unless you've got other stuff you want to add is you know I mean most guns that are built like this whether it's an alchemy or something else you know you're probably at least going to exceed a I'm gonna call it four grand yeah, um, yeah, you know I, I'd say on hand fit gun four grand is probably about the entry point mm -hmm. uh, ish you know ballpark so people that see this and you, you might go hey i'm not into 1911s i i, I want Which to be wrong yeah if you're not like but this doesn't have to be your starting point no. like yeah. this can be a pursuit versus a well i'm bad if i bought what was your first 1911 my first 1911 was a, a bone stock 1985 Colt government model. Yeah, so my first was a Springfield, I don't even remember the model, you know, just a base Springfield. <laughs> Springfield I picked up, picked up from a Springfield gun, <laughs> from a gun shop. And it's like, I loved it. I, I mean, to me it was incredible, because yeah. I didn't know what I was looking for. I was just like, dude, this is just this is just cool, you know, and I got yeah. a six inch at a long slide. That was my first 1911. You are ridiculous. It was like person. a six inch <laughs> long slide Springfield. Um, <laughs> but it's like, you, this can be aspirational, guys, especially if you're someone who, who goes, well, you, you know, I guess I could throw it on the credit card. It's like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. Like, uh, this yeah. ain't something to go into debt for. This is like, let this be a fun pursuit. No, absolutely. You know, it's one of those things, too, uh, and I'm going to bring up my age, which so for some fucking reason people think is a trope. Uh, you know, for some reason? Yeah. It's, oh. Yeah, you, like people, I say I just turned 26, and they're like, no, yeah, you, you're 40. That's your, like, funny thing. I'm like, no, oh. I'm actually 26. But the reason I bring that up is like something I always hear, especially from Gen Zers and, you know, a lot of millennials, is like, hey, you know, I don't have that kind of purchasing power, you know, I don't have the ability to get that gun. Or I see them like, you know, like you said, just slapping that thing on a credit card and that's yeah. not that's not really the proper yeah. way to do things. And I just say, listen, like, in all honesty, the marketing that I, I put out for Alchemy is not really, I mean, it is alchemy specific, but it's 1911 specific. I want you to just get into the 1911, okay? I want you to be able to have to buy a 1911 the next day, get a new pair of britches because your balls have grown overnight. Uh, it's one of those things, just get into the gun, start putting rounds on it, and from there, honestly, it helps. And this is serious. It helps when you start out with like a 
I don't want to even, you know, lower end gun. Yeah, because you know, normal production gun. By the time you get to this level, yeah. you know what you want. You appreciate it. You know what you want. And so, when, you know, when we're on the phone talking about your build, you're not just saying, oh, well, what would you recommend? By that point, you know, yeah, yeah. hey, I, I, I need an ambi safety. Hey, you know, I think I'm good. I need a magwell. You know, I want a commander over a government. I want mm -hmm. a government over a commander, whatever. You've kind of fleshed out some of the things because it is a big purchase. Yeah. You know, Big time. so you do want to kind of know a little bit about what you're talking about. So, you know, while plenty of our customers, they call me up, hey, man, this is my first 1911. I'm like, hell yeah, brother. Yeah, welcome. At the same time, you know, when I when somebody on my Instagram, they'll send me a picture. and it's, It makes my day. They send me a picture. Oh, man, I just got a T-Sauce, mil, you know, whatever the mil spec gun they make yeah, yeah, is, yeah. T-Sauce. And I'm like, damn right, son. You know, just get the 1911. We'll worry about, you know, getting you into an alchemy later. I just want you to be a damn American and get a, get a 1911. Well, and I think that these are the types of guns that get passed down um, yeah, yeah, heirloom through piece, yeah, generations yeah, yeah. and then become heirlooms and they're in wills and things because they do take on a significance. And for those that um, only shoot a, a, you know, a Glock or a whatever the hell the thing is, it's like, man, if you can't get on board, with having a 1911 in your collection, I don't know what to tell you, man. You, like, there's something jacked up in your, in, in your brain. I'm gonna be honest with you, people that, you know, only shoot shit like locks and such, they are not only a disappointment to the people that will they'll have to leave their guns to, okay? They're a disappointment to the people who have, you know, survived evolution all the way to them. You're, you're dishonoring your bloodline both, both before you and after you, really. I mean, imagine this, you know, you're on your deathbed, you know, you pass away, and the next day they read the will, and it's like, all right, you know, son, uh, you've taken care of me in the in the in the home for all these years. Mm -hmm. Here's a thank you, a Glock 19. Oh, kind of, kind of, kind of makes me think that I wasn't really loved. Yeah, you know, in that family. So, d Dad, I didn't know it was such a disappointment. <laughs> like, you know, and also like it's to me, also, you know, it's almost like the the American coat of arms. The 1911 is a pistol that's been a part of our country now for over a century. It's meant to be passed down. Mm -hmm. God wants Americans to carry 1911s. It's a part of our Monroe Doctrine. It's a part of our American dream. It is what makes Americans the greatest race of human beings that have ever, you know. God wants us to drive V8s and carry 1911s. Amen. Amen. Well, we will leave you guys with that. What a thrill. What a thrill it what was thrill. today. Yeah. You know? And uh, I, I do have a closing thought. Yeah, please. You know, just remember, when in doubt, pop go and spit on that thing. Catch you next week. <laughs> <laughs> that is so stupid. <laughs>